Is that right? Okay. Are now online. Oh, it's no longer practice. I can see. Right. It's the real thing. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I see you all clicking in. Yeah. Welcome to our very special event with author Marie Benedict tonight for her brand new book, Her Hidden Genius. Please use the chat box while everyone's logging in and let us know what state or city you are joining us from. It's always so fun. I know, it's fun to see where everybody's from. We are so thrilled tonight. I'm Pamela Klingerhorn from Valley Bookseller in Stillwater, Minnesota, and I am one of three hosts this evening. Mary O'Malley from Skylark Books in Columbia, Missouri is my co-host. And our third host store this evening is Excelsior Bay Books in beautiful Lake Minnetonka area, Excelsior, Minnesota. So we are thrilled to have you this evening and helping us welcome Marie Benedict. We're expecting a very large audience. So we will let everybody have just a moment or two here to click in before we get started with the official program. All three stores have beautiful hardcover copies of Her Hidden Genius. All three stores also have signed book plates from Marie, which you will get until they are all gone. Look at this gorgeous book. Beautiful. Lovely hardcover and my favorite when you open it up. Oh, it's no. Wonderful end papers with real photos of Rosalind. The real Rosalind Franklin. Yes, gorgeous. During the program, Mary and I will be putting in links so that you can just copy and paste them into your browser and go shopping at any of the three stores, Valley Bookseller, Skylark Bookshop, or Excelsior Bay. And you can stop in the store and pick up your book or have it sent to you or safe curbside shopping, whatever you prefer to do. And as I said, everyone, until we run out, will get a beautiful signed book plate. What a great gift. Valentine's Day is coming. A signed book makes a wonderful and unique gift. And it's a lot healthier than a box of chocolate. That's true. Although I do Looks like a good like, box of chocolate. I do like a good chocolate. I'm with Me you. too. We can together. <laughs> The chocolate with the book. Yes, exactly. Combination. That's a good combo. It is. Yeah, I like it. Great. Nice to see everyone. Such fun um, places. My, you know, as I think you know, um, Pamela, my my part of my family lives in, Min in, Min in Minnesota, in the Minneapolis area. So it's fun to see all the towns that people are from, many of which I've driven through at different times. So that's really fun for me. I wish it was in person. Hopefully. <laughs> One day soon, we'll be we'll be back together again because I've always loved your your events. They're amazing. We loved hosting you. We had you here for the other Einstein, and mm -hmm. you came back for I believe it was Carnegie's Made. Carnegie's Made. That's right. Is that the one where the power went out? That was the other Einstein. Was that the other Einstein? Yeah, oh my goodness! Horrible. And then um, we had you virtually, of course, for her person. Personal librarian. Yes. Pamela, we do have a couple of requests that it is hard to hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you for letting me know. Is this better? Your mom, your mom put that in the chat. Oh, thank you, mother. <laughs> She's always looking after me. I remember <laughs> meeting your mother. She is the cutest. <laughs> Thanks. I see you. lots of friends joining in, and there was another question. Yes, the recording of this will be available afterwards. Pamela will make sure that everybody gets a link to that. Yes, we will get this uploaded to YouTube and it will be available tomorrow on Facebook for mm -hmm. Valley Booksellers, Skylark Bookshop, and um, Excelsior Bay Books. We'll also be putting the word out on Twitter. And of course, you can always contact any of the stores if you want the link emailed directly to me. We'll make sure you get to watch it. Or if you want to share I just it have with to do it. Just a short shout out. I see that my aunt Dell is online from New Hampshire Yay. and I'm just going to say hi to aunt Dell. She's one of my fabulous, you know, family members. I just love her so much. And she is such like a cheerleader. She's the cutest. So and I have to say hi to Debbie and Christina, two uh, major fans that tune into so many of our events. So oh. hello, hello. And Becky, I saw you signed on too. Hello. We're gonna have fun tonight. That's great. absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. So so, and I said, I'm Pamela Klingerhorn with Valley Bookseller. My co-host this evening is Mary Weber O'Malley from Skylark Books in Columbia, Missouri. 
And our third host store is Excelsior Bay Books in Excelsior, Minnesota. All three stores have copies in stock and signed book plates from Marie. So please order online or stop in the store and pick up a book for yourself or for a gift or for your entire book club. It's a wonderful selection. I have popped yes, a link you. in the chat for purchasing it at Valley Bookseller. I'm also going to be putting one in for those of you who would like to purchase it at Excelsior Bay Books. And Mary will be adding one in for Skylark Books. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. And I am going to turn this over now to Mary O'Malley so she can introduce our special guest, Marie Benedict, this evening. Thank you so much, Pamela. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with you and with Marie, uh, one of my very favorite authors. And Marie Benedict is a former New York City commercial litigator and the author of novels inspired by women whose important achievements have been overlooked or underappreciated throughout history and are highly relevant to modern life. She has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, NPR, the Los Angeles Times, CBS This Morning, and Good Morning America. Her books include the New York Times bestsellers, The Only Woman in the Room, which is my personal favorite, The Mystery of Mrs. Christie, and The Personal Librarian, co-authored with Victoria Christopher Murray, as well as the bestsellers, The Other Einstein, Carnegie's Maid, Lady Clementine, and the newly released Her Hidden Genius. And Marie, I understand that you have a presentation for all of us tonight. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to see it. And I am going to turn the floor over to you. And everybody, as you listen along, if you have questions, do please put them into the chat box. And after the presentation, we'll get to those. So Marie, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you so much to my incredible hostesses tonight, Mary and Pamela, two of my favorite, favorite ladies and booksellers. I've had the great fortune of being with both of them in person on many occasions. Um, and I feel so fortunate that I was able to do that because so much of what we do today is virtual. And while I've loved that, these are some incredible booksellers, incredible women, and it's just really a treat to be here with both of them tonight. And Christina uh, from Sourcebooks, who's put this all together, but most of all, all of you. Thank you so much for coming. It is such a delight to actually get to be here today and chat with readers. Um, and I'm going to talk you through what I usually do um, when I do in person or now on virtual um, presentations, kind of give you um, a sense of the life and legacy of Rosalind Franklin. I'm going to pop up a PowerPoint for part of this. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my mission. I know some of you out there have attended other things that I've done. Certainly my aunt who's out there has attended many things I've done. Um, but I thought I'd give you just sort of a background into what my mission is, how I came to write these books, and then we're going to uh, do a deep dive into Rosalind's life. Um, so as our wonderful hostesses said today, it has been my great fortune to make a career out of writing novels about these important historical women whose lives and legacies have really been lost to the past for the most, um, most part. Um, and as the ladies mentioned, you know, I kind of really excavate from the past these important, complex, really fascinating women who have left us incredible legacies, but for the, for the most part, really don't know about their contributions. Um, we think about uh, historical women as leading very different lives from our own, but the reality is they very often struggle with much the same issues that we do today. And we really dive deep into that in my books and, and really extrapolate the lessons that, um, that they have, can bring to us in the modern day about those issues. Um, I hope at the end of the day, when you've read one or all my books, that you have a fresh lens to look at the past, that you, that you start to see these historical women where they've been all along, hiding in plain sight, waiting for us to find them. And then I hope if I do my job right, you can take that lens and use it to look at the women in our present time and in our future. You know, my hope is that 
one day books like this aren't necessary anymore, that we are very aware of the magnificence of women and our contributions. Um, and um, well, I hope to never stop writing. Maybe I could turn to something else because these books wouldn't be necessary anymore. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I came to write these stories. As Mary mentioned, I did not start off as a writer. If if some of you have listened to some of these talks, um, they always bring the ladies bring so many wonderful authors here before you. Um, you'll hear a lot of writers talk about how they always knew that that's what they wanted to do. From the very start, from the time they were kids, they wanted to write books. I was never that person. Um, I was a voracious reader. Um, I was that kid who always had her nose in a book, brought a book everywhere she went. Um, and when I was a girl and a young teenager, I had this incredible aunt, my aunt Terry. Um, she also happened to be an English professor and a poet and kind of a, an aside, kind of a rebellious nun. And she was like the dreamiest person to really keep me in books. She would give me the best, most unusual books for Christmas and my birthday or when she just came to visit. Um, and when I look back on the course of my life, it was those books that really put me on the path that I'm on today. One book in particular. That book is a book that most people have not heard of, but I always like to raise because, oh, and actually I should probably do my um, PowerPoint. I'm sorry, I get so carried away. Let's go to that. And sorry, you're going to have to bear with me as I figure out my technology. Here we go. Um, here are just some of the books that I've I've written. Um, so the book I'm going to talk about first is The Mists of Avalon. My aunt gave this to me for, um, for my birthday one year. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it, it was groundbreaking for its time. It was a female-centric retelling of the Arthurian legend. Um, it, it was completely different than anything I had read. Instead of Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, we had a female-centric story about Guinevere and her, um, Arthur's sister, Morgan Le Fay. And it opened up my eyes to the fact that there's this hidden world of women's stories, whether it's in legend or myth or lore or history. Um, and I started to ask myself how history is really fashioned. And I became fascinated with this idea that there are all these unknown stories of women in the past, women's voices that, um, that really add to and change the stories that we've been told. So when I headed off to college, I followed this passion and I became a history major. I think I always assumed maybe I'd become a professor or an archaeologist or something like that. But I got detoured along the way, as did uh, many history majors at that time, probably. Um, it was a, a big wave of women really being encouraged to go to law school and enter the legal profession at that time. And I kind of got swept up in it. And um, I ended up becoming a commercial litigator in New York City for over a decade, even though I knew from the beginning it wasn't what I was supposed to do. I was still fascinated with history and sort of the secrets and untold stories of the past. And I didn't know what I was going to do with that passion, but I knew I needed to find out. Um, and so I would sneak off during my very, very long work days and take graduate classes at NYU and Columbia, really thinking maybe I'd become a professor. And then one day I suddenly had an idea for a story. Um, I had never written anything before. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and I wrote it in drips and drabs over a period of many years until I finally gained the courage to walk down the riskier, more authentic path of writing fiction about unknown historical women. Um, so I thought I'd talk for a little bit, you know, I, I've written about many different women and I thought I'd talk for a minute um, about a question that I get asked probably more than any other. And that is, how do I find these women? Um, you know, when you look at these covers, I don't, you probably can't tell, but they're from women, for, they're about women from a huge variety of time periods, from a variety of places. Um, they talk about topics ranging from literature to philanthropy to science um, to libraries. Um, and so I really go where the women follow. A lot of historical fiction writers are, have a deep fascination with a particular time period and sort of center their stories in and around that period. For me, it's really that um, I keep a list of fascinating, important women from the past and once I settle on a particular woman, 
I go where she leads me. Um, but how does that work? How do I find them? What is this so-called antenna that I have? Um, and I thought maybe the best way to explain it is through a couple of my books. So I thought we'd start with The Other Einstein, which um, is the story of Maleva Marish Einstein, Albert Einstein's first wife, who was a physicist herself and the role she may have played in the development of his theories. This fantastic, important woman I found one day when I was reading a scholastic um, biography, children's biography called Who Was Albert Einstein with uh, my son, who was then quite young. Um, and I learned that Albert Einstein's first wife was in uh, school with him in college. This was at a time when very few women went to college and I just became intrigued with her. And when I went down the rabbit hole, looking for answers to questions like, who was she? What role did she play? Um, I found a woman who was so important in her own right. She was much more than a footnote to Albert Einstein's story. Um, another example would be the book that Mary mentioned earlier, The Only Woman in the Room, um, which is the story of the, uh, the golden age of Hollywood actress, Hedy Lamarr. But it's not her Hollywood story. It's the story of how, in truth, she was a Jewish refugee escaping a Nazi war uh, military arms dealing husband um, who came to this country, uh, embarked on this um, very successful acting career, but had always been um, an engineer um, behind the scenes. And she created an invention for the war. Um, and uh, over time, that uh, invention became Wi-Fi. Um, and once I kind of learned about the breadth of her legacy, I knew hers was a story I absolutely had to tell. Some of you might be familiar with um, this book, The Personal Librarian. It was my first co-written novel with my sister partner, um, Victoria Christopher Murray. It's the story of Belle Costa Green, um, this unbelievable woman who became the personal librarian to um, JP Morgan, uh, curated his collection of rare books and manuscripts. She became in her lifetime, one of the most powerful people in the art world but she was only able to do it by hiding her real identity in plain sight. She was passing, she was a black woman passing as white. Um, how did I find her? Um, I think I mentioned my long years as a New York City commercial litigator. Sometimes I would escape and take classes. Other times I would escape and go to the magnificent cultural institutions um, in New York City. The Morgan Library, uh, the, the library that Abel de Costa Green helped build, became a refuge during that time. And a docent happened to mention Bell to me um, at that time. This was many years ago, long before she was highlighted at the library itself. Um, and Bell de Costa Green made her way onto my list. So that's just kind of a, an overview of what I do and why I do it. But how did I come across the astonishing woman? Oh, there's my co-writer, Victoria Christopher Murray, um, the, at the heart of this book, Rosalind Franklin. So Rosalind Franklin, um, she's a woman I'd been aware of for some time. You may be aware of her. All I really knew about her was that she was a brilliant British scientist and that she played some kind of role in the discovery of the structure of DNA. Um, and then I knew that her contributions were super important, but that her role had been marginalized or suppressed in some way. That's really all I knew about her. And over time, I started, she made my list a long time ago. Um, and then I started to notice her name appear places. Um, she became a Google Doodle. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but at the top of the Google homepage, they'll highlight important historical figures from time to time. Um, I knew that a Mars rover was named after her, the Rosalind Franklin. And actually, I think it's about to launch next year or actually this fall. Um, I knew a um, medical school had been named after her, Rosalind Franklin University. Um, and there's other things as well. There's the Rosalind Franklin Institute in the UK, which is cutting edge research. So I knew that there, there started to be an awareness of who she was, what she did, um, and her, the need to honor her, right? I knew that that was starting to sort of rise up into the consciousness in the scientific world, but I didn't know if people outside that world started to really knew much about her. Um, but this is Rosalind. Welcome, meet her. Um, and, but then I learned two things about her um, that really propelled me into that rabbit hole of research where I often um, 
love to lose myself. Um, as you can imagine doing what I do, my friends and family have become very attuned to this sort of hunt for historical women. People will send me articles or ideas and I love it. I get, I got lots of them from readers. So if you guys have any, let me know. Um, one day, um, one of my very dear friends, uh, a, a woman who's really heroic in her own right. She is an ER physician. And during nine 11, uh, she was in New York city and she led the red cross efforts, um, at the twin towers. She is um, an unbelievable person herself. Um, and she had been reading a nonfiction book about the history of genetics. And she called me and said, okay, I don't know who else is on your list, but you have to turn to Rosalind Franklin next. And I was like, okay, cause I do get a lot of calls like this. I was like, okay, um, why? You know, she's on my list. I know she made this great contribution, but I don't know enough about her life to know if her story is the right one. She said, well, first of all, without giving away any spoilers, um, she made the ultimate sacrifice for her discoveries. And we can talk about that later. Um, and that intrigued me. And then she said in the years after she did her research on DNA, she actually did unbelievable work on RNA and viruses. And she said that she probably would have been won the Nobel prize for that too, if she could have finished her work. And I thought, okay, there's so much more to the story than, than what I thought, even though that was probably enough in and of itself. Um, and I'm so thankful that my friend kind of prompted me down this path because the life and legacy of Rosalind Franklin is crucial and captivating on so many levels, some of which I didn't and couldn't appreciate until I started writing the novel. So let's talk about Rosalind Franklin. Um, she was born in 1920 to an affluent Anglo-Jewish family that had been in banking for well over a century. Um, she lived in this neighborhood. This isn't exactly where she lived exactly, but it's Notting Hill. Um, she, the, she was all education was hugely important in the Franklin family. Um, Rosalind was always drawn to science from a very young age. And while that wasn't um, something that a lot of the other, the Franklins had pursued, um, she was very much encouraged um, in her, in her academic pursuits. Um, she went to Newnham College, which is part of Cambridge at that time. Um, you couldn't really, um, there were only certain colleges that women could matriculate into. Um, she stayed and she eventually got her PhD in chemistry. It was while she started working on her doctorate that, and this is important really for the story, these, these very siloed scientific disciplines started to kind of coalesce. Um, and they, and the scientists or the community started to realize that in order to answer these big questions, um, that they were really starting to tackle. They needed to look at things, not just from a chemistry perspective, but maybe biology at the same time, maybe not just chemistry, but physics at the same time. And um, Rosalind loved this, this kind this piece of it and the way of looking at these things from a variety of angles. And that's important for our story. Um, after she got her doctorate um, during the war, excuse me, she, this is Rosalind again. I love this picture of her. And this is the one that is on the inside flap of the book. Um, during the war, um, Rosalind helped out by doing science for the British Coal Association. It doesn't, it's not a natural, um, it doesn't naturally sound like it would help the war effort, but she was studying the microscopic properties of coal and um, looking at the ways in which coal could be util utilized and helpful during wartime, including things in like gas masks in which coals re coal was used as part of the filters. Um, when the war ended, um, she really struggled to find a position that was to her liking. She had become in this cross dis multidisciplinary look at science and the big questions, she had become very interested and, and very um, expert in sort of the micro universe, um, the atoms and molecules that really made up different substances. Um, it was not easy to find a position in that type of um, space. And she was fortunate, this woman on the, I don't know if it's gonna be on your left, but it's the only woman in the picture. This is Adrienne Weil. Um, she was a um, brilliant scientist herself. She was taught by Marie Curie. And during the war, she was a French Jewish refugee. She came to live in England and she taught at Cambridge and she became very close to Rosalind, um, really became her mentor. 
And she introduced Rosalind to two French scientists, Marcel Mathieu and Jacques Mering, um, and they hired her to work in their lab in Paris. Um, now, this labo, as uh, Rosalind called it, was really dreamy. It was really everything that she would have hoped for. It was a government-sponsored lab where scientists were encouraged to work on what they were interested in, um, which is rare, as you can imagine. And it was also maybe even more rare. It was very accepting and encouraging of women scientists. There were many women um, doctorates who worked in the lab. Um, and there was just a general acceptance of women overall, not just in the workplace, but in the sort of socializing and interacting that happens outside the workplace that is very beneficial to developing sort of collegial relationships. Um, and that's going to be important shortly. Um, one of the things that is incredibly important that Rosalind did during this time is she became very uh, well trained, well, very well versed in something called x-ray crystallography. This is an image of it. Um, and I'm going to give you as simple an explanation as I can, because it is super important for our story. Um, it is a very painstaking technique to look at and um, sort of learn about the three-dimensional structure of a molecule or an atom. Um, basically, you have to crystallize a substance, um, and then that's in very tiny uh, amounts, and x-ray beams are shot through it for long, long periods of time, sometimes hundreds of hours. And a photographic paper is placed behind that. And what happens is a scatter plot. The x-ray beams are di diffracted into a variety of directions from the crystalline substance. And that scatter plot is then measured. Um, the angles, the intensities, and there, a co complex mathematical formula is utilized. And through this very laborious methodical practice, um, a scientist can produce a three-dimensional picture of the density of, a, of the atomic structure of an atom. They basically can solve for the structure of a molecule this way. So again, sorry for that, but here we move on. So um, Rosalind loved the labo. She loved learning X-ray crystallography. She became really expert in it. Um, and she developed an international reputation for the, the insights she brought to using that technique to carbons. But a very personal situation developed at the Labo, which you'll have to read about in the pages of Her Hidden Genius. And she really felt compelled to leave. Um, she knew no place would be as perfect as the Labo. And that is kind of heartbreaking. But she did learn that Professor Randall, who had become famous during, for his work during the Manhattan Project, had formed this unique interdisciplinary group at King's College, which we see pictured here. Um, Rosalind was awarded a fellowship. Um, in his unit, and she was hired to, st to study using x-ray crystallography to study the, um, the structure of protein solutions. However, right before she started, um, she started in January of 1951. You can see in this letter from Professor Randall dated December 1950, he changed what she was going to, to be studying. Instead of studying protein, he told her that she, he would like her to study complex, uh, certain biological fibers. Now, when, to me, I wouldn't know what that meant to Rosalind that meant, she knew what that meant. That meant DNA. Um, and that was not what she was hired to do initially, but she was delighted to embark on this study because this was one of those key, um, questions that a lot of sci uh, scientists were struggling with at this time. Um, they knew that just so you understand what science understood about DNA and genetics at this time, people knew that DNA had something to do with genes. They didn't know what, they didn't know um, what it did, what its structure was like, how it worked, how it replicated. Um, but they knew, they had this sense that to unlock all those huge big questions and really launch into genetics as we understand it today, they first had to unlock the structure of DNA. Um, Rosalind was very lucky that she was assigned a, a wonderful graduate um, student to help her. This gentleman, Raymond Gosling, I only have a picture of him when he's an older man. So sorry, he was, you have to imagine him a lot younger. And they launched right into work. Um, they used um, this, uh, I'll give you, oh, sorry. Um, they launched right into work, starting their X-ray crystallography assessment of DNA. Um, 
but what happened uh, really set the really changed the course of history at that point. Um, what Rosalind did not know, and nobody told her, was that this gentleman, Morris Wilkins, who also worked at the biophysics unit, but who had been on an extended leave, had been working on DNA before Rosalind started. And that Professor Randall, who's, who um, controlled and ran the unit, um, he had taken it from him and given it to Rosalind, but nobody told Morris Wilkins. So you can imagine this man returns from leave, leave confused, angry. Um, John Randall, the head of the unit, doesn't explain it to her. Um, and he assumed at first that, that Rosalind was there to assist him. Um, and so the, the dynamic, and Rosalind set him straight on that right away. Um, this set up this incredibly acrimonious dynamic between them, even though it really had nothing to do with Rosalind, it wasn't her fault. Um, but Rosalind also had a very strong, firm personality. And during that time period, that was not a personality that was really palatable um, to come from women. And so this, this really unpleasant dynamic started between them. And as our story evolves, we'll see how it impacted really the course of history. Um, Rosalind tried to put her uh, issues with, um, with Wilkins aside. Um, she and Gosling, her research ass assistant, worked day after day, month after month um, on these um, studies of DNA. Um, this is an example, it's a sort of basic diagram of how it worked. Kind of already explained it to you, but you can see the DNA strands on that little hook. That little hook is actually an unbent paper clip. If that gives you any sense how rudimentary some of this stuff was, they would, they would treat the strands. That was a huge part of this. And something that Rosalind was amazing at was to create a variety of different strands that had different properties and qualities and then study them. That was actually a place that's a cork, a wine cork, and the x-ray beams went right through it and went onto a piece of paper, a photographic paper here, you can see photograph 51. Um, photograph 51 is what they eventually created. It's one of the most famous, um, revered uh, scientific images of all time. It was unbelievably important because it very, very clearly showed that DNA was a double helix to a scientist. That X symbol would have shown the helical properties of DNA. But there's so much more to it than that. Rosalind had to analyze it, perform all these laborious mathematical calculations. They had no computers, of course, at the time. Um, and Rosalind's approach was very frustrating to Wilkins. Even though he wasn't assigned to work on DNA anymore, he knew that other scientists were working on the, the puzzle of its structure. And he was frustrated that Rosalind wasn't just hopping right to it and coming up um, with an answer. Um, and he started to, um, that's photograph 51 again, he started to relay his frustration with two scientists he became friendly with at Cambridge. One was this gentleman, Francis Crick, whose name you might be familiar with. That's him again. And this gentleman, James Watson, who you also might be familiar with. This is him when he's a little bit older. Um, and these, he would, uh, Morris Wilkins would go off to Cambridge for the weekend or meet these gentlemen for, at the pub and complain about Rosalind, um, how difficult she was, how she should be sharing the DNA assessment with her. And bit by bit, um, he would start to share um, the results of her research with these gentlemen. Now, these gentlemen had been banned by the head of their lab at Cambridge from working on DNA. There was a gentleman's agreement between King's College, where Rosalind worked, and Cambridge, where these gentlemen worked, um, that only King's College would work on DNA. But Crick and Watson were, in it, were obsessed with DNA. And listening to Wilkins talk about Rosalind, talk about all that she was researching and finding, descriptions of what she was learning with her images and her measurements, um, they decided secretly to continue working on DNA. And one day without Rosalind's knowledge or consent, um, Wilkins showed these gentlemen photograph 51 and all of her data. Within weeks of um, having all that research, they built um, a model. This is actually the model, it's in a museum, it's really hard to get a picture of, sorry. Um, this model um, 
created what was really a three-dimensional creation of what Rosalind already knew um, DNA was uh, the structure of DNA. Only by using the data that took her years to assemble could they actually build this model. No one at King's College, with the exception of Wilkins, of course, knew about the disclosure of Rosalind's information. Uh, people suspected something had happened because you can't build a proper model without data and they had been banned from working on the data. Um, Randall, the head of, uh, of Rosalind's or King's College was furious with Wilkins, Watson and Crick, um, if for nothing else for breaking their agreement to work on DNA. Um, as a sort of consolation, um, Watson and Crick were writing up a paper based on their model that was gonna be published in the prestigious Nature Journal it was decided that everyone would write a paper and Rosalind would have one as well. But of course, as you can imagine, it was Watson and Crick's discovery that stole the show. Um, they had not only used her data to create the double helix structure, but um, they made some, uh, some logical leaps in terms of the way the base pairing uh, worked. Um, that, and she was right there. Um, in a few weeks, she would have very likely made all of these um, determinations herself, but because what Wilkins gave Watson and Crick that, that extra leap, um, she wasn't able to do this. By the time this happened, Rosalind had already decided to leave. Um, the, the workplace environment at King's College was toxic to say the least. She, would work, she had planned to work at Birkbeck College, at, at, which is part of the University of London, um, under the famous scientist J.D. Burnell, who was actually like BFFs with Picasso, but that's just an aside. Um, there, Rosalind used her X-ray crystal, uh, crystallography technique on viruses and DNA. And she was lucky in that she had a wonderful collaborator there, Aaron Klug. Um, and as Watson and Crick gained all this fame for their discoveries in the years that followed, Rosalind was embarking on yet another unbelievably prolific period in her life, um, discovering the structure of DNA, making huge strides in the understanding of viruses, including polio. Um, Rosalind was not able to finalize this research for reasons you'll have to learn about in the pages of the book. Um, and Later, she wasn't included in the Nobel Prize that was given to Watson, Crick, and Legacy, uh, Legacy, sorry, Wilkins. Um, Aaron Klug also won a Nobel Prize for the work that he started with, um, uh, with Rosalind. And it has been surmised that had she been able to complete that book or that research, that she would have won a second Nobel Prize. So when you think about it, um, Rosalind Franklin really did deserve not one, but two of these um, incredible prizes. Um, Rosalind's legacy is so enormous. Um, one of the things I learned about um, as I was researching this book, which I wrote for a lot of the part um, during COVID and during the lockdowns, is that um, as we were understanding COVID and as all these incredible female scientists like Kismikia Corbett were trying to put together virus, uh, viruses, vaccines that would work with the viruses. Um, I learned that this latter work that Rosalind did with Aaron Klug um, was actually foundational for the create the understanding of COVID and the creation of those viruses. Um, so not only are her contributions so important for our understanding of DNA, which basically unlocked genetics and allows us to do such advanced things today as like CRISPR technology, but they're also crucial um, to where we are today in fighting this pandemic. Um, so Rosalind Franklin um, is an amazing woman, obviously. And if I do have done my job right once again, I hope this light, this novel she really shines a bright light on her and her work just like she did with DNA. Um, and I really hope that her genius really won't be hidden any longer. And that that lens that I talked about early on will allow us to see her and her role differently, but it will also make sure that um, her historical sisters, her all the female scientists that really stand on her shoulders 
won't be forgotten anymore. I don't want those women to be in the shadows. So um, I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview of Rosalind Franklin and her hidden genius. It's obviously a lot more to it than that, but I would love to chat with Mary and Pamela about it and take your questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful oh. presentation. Gosh, that really enriched my reading experience. Thank you. Yeah, agree. Well, I'll tell you that the science was, I am not a scientist and doing the scientific research to write this book and really understand Rosalind was, uh, was daunting. You know, it's the, I've written about female scientists before, but in this particular book, you know, it's almost like the science is another character that you have to understand. It plays such a huge role. Um, and I just hope I got it right and made it accessible and um, a little bit interesting even. I don't know. It's so, so tricky. I thought it was fascinating. I know Mary agrees with me. Yes, absolutely. And I was amazed at, uh, because I am not a science person. And usually when I see a lot of science going in, I'm like, ah, but not only did you make it accessible, you made me want to learn more about it and connect those dots. So that, that was a feat. Oh, thank you. Well, I figure if I can understand it and I can find it interesting, anybody can, right? And the only way to really understand what Rosalind was doing, why it was so important, how it's so important today, you have to understand high level, the science. You really do. Absolutely. Did you have someone that you were able to go to with questions? Thank God. Um, I have a good friend who is actually has a PhD in chemistry from Princeton. And um, she read the book early on. I would go to her with questions uh, throughout. And then she read it. Um, she was one of the first people to read it. And she gave me some fantastic feedback. What was tricky even for her, to be honest, which a reader wouldn't be aware of, is that you're trying to understand chem, uh, you know, science, a variety, and not just chemistry, but bio biology and physics as well. But you're understand, trying to understand it from a historical perspective, right? This understanding genetics before it really became genetics, right? So you're kind of not just understanding the science, but you're understanding science before our time. And that does become tricky and, and understanding the lab equipment. And you know, what's so important for this story without giving too much away is what they understood about the dangers of what they were doing, the radiation. Um, I really had to do a lot of research into what protective gear did they wear? What did they think might happen if they were conducting experiments standing like in an x-ray beam for hours? So, you know, those, those were things that were also part of the story as well and very, very important to the outcome. That was one of the questions that arose for me because she talks about, Rosalind talks about what happened to Marie Curie and yet they all seem to have a very somewhat cavalier attitude towards right. precautions. So I was wondering, you know, how you found out about that and what was your perception? Yeah, that was, that was really hard for me because, you know, to think that there might be this cavalier attitude about something that has such dangerous potential. And you have Rosalind, who is such a careful scientist. You know, one of the things that drove Wilkins crazy about her is that she was so methodical and careful, which of course, it's like a quality you want in a scientist. I don't know why that was his problem, but um, but in this case, I couldn't, I really struggled with that. Why she would not wear her dosimeter, which measured the radiation exposure, why she wouldn't wear any protective gear. But when I researched it, I learned that so many of them didn't. And the reason they didn't is because there actually had not been a lot of in-depth studies on the impact of kind of low level radiation on individuals. And these are people for whom, who are begging for proof, right? They're not just going to say, oh, wait, I hear that's dangerous. They're going to need to see a report that tells them it's dangerous because all those precautions are slowing down their work. Um, and they're super dedicated. They've got blinders on. And so they're willing to take those risks. They did know, um, for example, the, the probably most known examples of the impact of radiation on individuals happened during the Manhattan Project. There were some really awful 
explosions, vast quantities of x-rays and other, other types of rays. And they could see that, but I think the scientists kind of thought, well, those are the extreme cases. I'm just getting this little tiny bit of radiation. What's that gonna do to me? So I, that was a risk that a lot of them were taking, which was surprising. I do see a few questions in the chat. Um, let's see, we've got uh, from Candace, how did you find all the information on Rosalind? Are her papers at an archive and where do you find the personal info on, on your subjects? So, um, well, there are some wonderful biographies about her, which I do recommend, one by Brenda Maddox, and the most to me important is the one by Ann Sayre, which um, was a good, she was a good friend of Rosalind's. Um, and the reason I mentioned secondary source material, because I actually rely mostly on original source material, it's, is that I'm indebted to Ann Sayre. And it's for this reason. Um, James Watson in 1968, I think it is, he wrote an autobiography of the discovery of DNA, which is laughable because, you know, I mean, he couldn't have done it without Rosalind. And he mentions her in it and he portrays her in the most appalling, negative, stereotypical light you could imagine. The dark, grumpy female scientist in the corner who was never willing to help anybody. She was you know, it was like she was an albatross. Um, and personally, I believe he probably did that because even at that point, there was a sense that he, information had been taken and used without proper attribution. So in any event, that, that book uh, caused really outrage, um, not just with family members and friends, but with the scientific community and other things as well. Her friend, Ann Sayre, who was married to a scientist that worked with Rosalind, was one of those people who was outraged. Um, it totally depicted her in the wrong light. And she also knew, because she knew enough science to be dangerous, that that is not how it happened. That's not how the discovery happened. And she had a very good sense of how important Rosalind was. So she, in the early 1970s, she set out on a multi-year quest to do a deep, deep dive research into um, letters, documents, files, research, data, and she interviewed every single person involved at that time. Wow. That formed the basis for her biography, but I am so fortunate because she took all that stuff and she filed it with the American Society for Microbiology's library. And during COVID, when everything was shut down and you couldn't get anything, um, there was a wonderful librarian there who literally copied it all and sent it to me. So in answer to, was it Candace's question? That is the information I had on her. I had, you know, this was her dear friend who was very close with the family. So she had not only wonderful letters and stories about Rosalind's childhood and her young adulthood, you know, things that really weren't otherwise known, but she had all this incredible stuff about what actually happened. And she was able to interview every single person who was involved, most of whom aren't alive anymore. Um, so that formed, you know, that I have to say that was one of the most fortunate uh, incidents I ever had with research to have all that. And it, it helped me in fleshing out literally every part of Rosalind. That's so amazing. Exciting. We have a question right. from Minnesota author Gretchen Anthony. And oh, she hi. is, yes, she's wondering if since putting your mission into action, which I think mm -hmm. everything means by mission, writing these things back into history, have you found yourself changing the way you talk about history in everyday conversation? Oh, yes. And for I I'm apologize in advance for anyone who's had a historical conversation <laughs> with me. Because, you know, I wouldn't say I'm combative, but a, but I'm firm in the fact that when we are talking about what happened in the past, whether it's American history or European history, you know, I don't, I can't profess to be an expert on every single topic, but I know, I, I do know enough to be dangerous. And I know that when we talk about those, whatever the piece of history is, there are suppressed voices and contributions that are not being told. And um, so when I hear people tell about something definitive that happened in the past without considering the women or, um, you know, indigenous people or what, whatever the group is, um, I absolutely point that out. And, you know, I don't, 
I, again, I don't profess to be an expert in everything, but I do think you absolutely have to consider all those perspectives because there is not one history. There's many histories in a particular time period. That's amazing. And Sharon Person would like to know if any of the relatives have read the book and reached out to you. Yes, I've been so fortunate. Um, last week, well, actually, I take that back. Um, before the book came out, um, I was in contact. I'd reached out to Rosalind Franklin University, and I just wanted to share the story with them. And, you know, because I know they have taken on her name, and she's like a guiding light to them, her, her iconics, the sense of her. Um, and at the same time as that happened, one of her, ne her nephews reached out to me and in the weeks that followed sort of right before and after publication, um, I started to be into contact with all of her nieces and nephews, um, or at least the, the six that, that I believe live in the U S that were all descendants of one of her brothers. And they've attended some of my events. I don't think any of them are here tonight. I've emailed and had long con personal conversations with with most of them and they have been unbelievable um, in terms, cause you, that, you know, that's what I hope for. I always hope that the families see that I'm trying to honor the woman and that I'm, you know, whether I'm telling something flattering or not, whether I'm adding a fictional piece or telling a, a very nonfiction based piece, all of it is in service of the woman and um, trying to honor her and her legacy and her life. And they have been unbelievable in terms of that, just thanking me for the portrayal of her that, you know, talking so much about the one or two dimensional image that have been portrayed, that she's been portrayed as, you know, this blinders on scientist, but not a whole person. And um, it's been, it's been so meaningful to me because they too want to carry on her light and legacy. And um, I feel so fortunate that they, see what I'm trying to do in the light that I intended to have it. Megan in the audience has a question about when you're writing historical fiction, how much do you keep factual and what part of the fiction is actually woven in? Well, you know, let's just take like what, what I just talked about in terms of what I discovered, right? And the information I had at my disposal from Ann Sayers files, um, all of that, information, those letters, descriptions of her schooling and incidents that happened in her youth, things that happened when she was um, working as a professional, all of that stuff really forms the architecture of the story. It's the foundation, the pillars, the roof, but there are always going to be things that even with that wealth of research, you're not going to know. Um, as one example, we don't know what Rosalind knew or didn't know about Crick and Watson's use of her data. There are things, there's little bits and pieces we know she knew and a lot we don't know. So like that would be a very good example of, I have to fill that in because it's a huge part of the story and I'm telling a first person account, right? So as I go in there, I have to make a decision about what she knew and she didn't know. So a lot of times you'll get kind of into those crosshairs in the shadows where no matter what research you have without the woman here, we, nobody really knows the answer. Um, and it's in those shadows that the fiction comes in. Now, I hope it's not like just willy nilly fiction. You know, I'm really trying to ground it in the, the data I have, the research I have and, and the woman I've created, because even though, you know, these stories are based on real women, they are fiction. This is my version of Rosalind Franklin. It's not her, it's because we she's not here. You know, I'm just doing my best to honor what we do know of her and if hopefully inspire people to, to find out more. That's amazing. And Christina Powers would like to know, and hi, Christina, uh, with your running list of women, mm -hmm. are there any one or more uh, women that are in more contemporary times that you have in mind to write about? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I mean, I think, I mean, there's so many women, like part of me would love to go back to like ancient Greece and write about those women, but um, there's, you know what, I'm interested in women whose legacies we can get a handle on. And that's more true with, with more contemporary women. Um, 
I can say there's definitely, uh, Rosalind is definitely the most contemporary person I've written about. And, and the fact that she still has so much family alive is part of, part of why I'm able to have contact with her family. Um, I would say the, of the other women I've written about are the ones that I'm considering. I don't know that anyone comes quite as close. The next two books I have coming out after this um, are set in the 1930s and 40s. So they're not quite, you know, Rosalind's the 1940s and 50s. Um, they're a little bit behind that, but they are, you know, I don't think anything closer than that have I really thought about so far. Not that there aren't women who are deserving of having their stories told in that time period, that's for sure. But I think that that time period is, is probably the, the most um, modern I would get. There, of course, is question about what you're working on next. Other than the time period, are you able to give any more yeah. of here? Yeah, I have two books coming out next year. Um, one in January, it's called The Mitford Affair. And it's the story of three sisters um, in the lead up to World War II, three British sisters. Um, two of the sisters become enamored of fascism. One it, uh, leaves her husband and marries to marries the head of British fascism, and one sister uh, trots off to Germany and becomes, some would say, the mistress of Hitler. Um, there, one of their, uh, they were actually six sisters, but the one of the other sisters starts as the things become more heated in terms of the relations between Great Britain and Germany, um, starts to grow suspicious of some of the things that the sisters are doing. And um, she has to make a choice whether she's going to spy on them um, and unearth what she suspects they're doing or whether she and really, you know, uh, stick with her loyalty to her country or if she's going to stay loyal to her family at, at whatever the cost. Um, and the sisters are part of the famous Mitford sisters. Um, in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, there were six sisters uh, that were in the British aristocracy. They were famous. They were the it girls of their day. Each one more beautiful, brilliant, eccentric than the next. They filled the gossip columns. But this part of their story was known at the time, but not, um, not Nancy Mitford, who's my character, not the role that she played. She became a famous novelist in the years after the war. Um, but we don't know the extent of her legacy because if in fact, what she did or what she, we, she believed she did um, stopped what Unity and Diana were doing. It really could have been catastrophic for the war. But it's also a story that I think has a lot of modern pieces to it, a lot of modern reverberations in that it is the story of what happens to families when there's a divide in politics um, and the links that family members will or won't go for their politics. So it has a lot of modern day parallels as well. Sounds fascinating. Thank you. They're, they're unbelievable. These, the these women. sisters are endlessly interesting, aren't they? They really are. They yeah. really are. And I, this is definitely a book where I had to cut stuff out. I mean, some of the stuff is oh my god crazy stuff great even the stuff I put in there my editor would send me notes saying is this true like oh my god like but yes it's crazy can't wait to read it can't yeah. wait to read it and then the last question we had in there is about the personal librarian and plans for an mm -hmm. adaptation Yes, we have been, Victoria and I have been so excited. Um, I, I don't know if any of you saw or were aware of, um, our book was the Good Morning America Book Club pick in July. And we had a wonderful experience at the Morgan Library. This was right when things opened up. Um, and we were interviewed by Deborah Roberts, who's Al Roper's wife. She's an ABC correspondent. Um, and we connected with her so strongly. I, it was really uncanny. Um, and in the months that followed, they um, decided to, that they wanted to produce, that Al Roker and Deborah Roberts wanted to, to take um, the personal librarian and turn it into a limited series. And so we have just been over the moon excited. They are incredible people, incredible advocates. They, they love that. They love Belle Costa Green as much, if not more than Victoria and I do. And that says a lot because we love Belle. Um, 
and they are just supportive, incredible people. So we are so feel so honored that they've chosen to, to make this their first dual producing project. They have never produced anything as a couple before. So that's really exciting. And that they are just really um, excited to get behind this story. So we're, we're just thrilled. That is so exciting. Thank and you. I just want to say as a bookseller, I have never been more animated hand selling books as I am when I'm hand selling any one of your novels. So all of you that are watching, I really please go to any one of the stores that are uh, partnering tonight, Excelsior Bay, Valley Bookseller, Skylark Bookshop, order your copy of Her Hidden Genius, you'll get a signed book plate. And you know what, just go ahead and hit up all of Marie's back stock because honestly, <laughs> they make the best book club books. I, I, I get so passionate when I'm talking to people about your books, just like you talked about, you know, talking about history, I get that way, uh, talking about your books. So please, you know, support your independent books, yeah. bookstores. Uh, we can keep bringing you shows like this and authors like this if you support us uh, in that endeavor. So that's my little spiel. I'll give Pamela her, her last words too. That. Well, I want to thank my co-host, Mary, and of course, yes. everybody at Valley Booksellers, Skylark Bookshop, and Excelsior Bay Books for helping to put together this wonderful event tonight, as well as Marie's wonderful publishers at Source Books. They're fantastic. And most of all, thank you to Marie. I've loved hosting you in person, and I look forward to the day when we can do that again, maybe next I know. at Bedford Sister Book. Oh. In the meantime, we are so grateful to you for coming to join us virtually with Her thank Hidden you. Genius. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy. Just I a joy. This book. I know book clubs are going to love it. Avid readers are going to love it. Women who love science, men who love yeah. science are going to love it. This is a book that is going to appeal to so many people. And I just really encourage you all, pick it up, take a look. You're going to love it. So. Thank you guys. Thank you so much for having me. You guys are the best. I can't wait till we get to all be together again. And I get to see the two sisters, you two together. <laughs> My literary twin, Mary. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Victoria and I always call each other the unlikely twins, you know, it's the obvious difference, but you guys are obvious twins. <laughs> Well, I did put my email address in the chat. It's pkhorn at mchsi.com. If you want to email me, I'm happy to directly email you a link to the recording tomorrow. Otherwise, everybody's social media channels tomorrow will be deluging social media with copies of the recording. And you can watch it there. Share it with your friends. Share it with your book clubs. Share it with everyone you love. And most of all, read her hidden genius. You're going to be so happy you picked it up. Thank you guys so much. It was such a delight and a pleasure to be here tonight. Oh, Thanks thank you, everyone. Marie. Thanks, thank Mary. You. Thank, thank you. Ladies. Bye friends. Bye everyone. Good night. Thank you. Happy reading.